You might know of many of the celebrated artists associated with Chelsea in the 19th century, such as Turner, Whistler, who painted along the embankment, and one of the founders of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And you see behind me uh, Rossetti Studios, which was built right at the end of the, late, of the 19th century and named after Rossetti. And it was here that Augustus John and William Orpin founded the Chelsea Art School in 1904. But the story that I want to uh, tell today and the tour that I want to take you on through Chelsea looks at a different group of artists. Um, artists, theatre practitioners and dancers who arrived in Chelsea and made it their home in the first decades of the 20th century, uh, in the lead up to the First World War and during the First World War. And many of the artists and dancers in, in this circle uh, that came to be known as the Little Theatre Network in Chelsea uh, shared a commitment to pacifist politics and many were also involved in the campaign for suffrage. So today we're going to be following in the footsteps of some of those in the Chelsea Little Theatre community. So we begin here at the corner of Flood Street and the King's Road at what was the site of the Margaret Morris Theatre. And we begin with Margaret Morris because she was at the heart of the Chelsea Little Theatre Network and was a pioneering dancer. She set up her dance school in, in the 1910s, but it was in 1914 that she set up the Margaret Morris Theatre. So the Margaret Morris Theatre attracted many of the leading artists, intellectuals, writers and dancers of the day, ranging from the vorticists, painters such as Wyndham Lewis and the poet Ezra Pound, to composers such as Eugene Goosens and Cyril Scott, and many, many others, uh, including uh, the writer Catherine Mansfield and her husband uh, John Middleton Murray. Like many of the little theatres in Chelsea, Margaret Morris was inspired by the Vogue for Hellenism, the ideal um, of the Gesamtskunstwerk, the total work of art, and a kind of synthesis, and a kind of aesthetic synthesis. Um, if you'd come to a performance here at her theatre, you'd have witnessed bold costume designs, vivid colour and form in her set designs, many of which were also partly inspired by Ferguson and his commitment to rhythm and colour in his own art. So we can get a glimpse into what the theatre would have been like uh, from one of Morris's leading dancers, Ellen Vanell, who, uh, who writes that the theatre was cramped, dark and a bit sinister, with its green curtain stage, long mirror and small paned coloured glass windows. Yet the moment one entered this strange little theatre perched above the shops on the King's Road, one came to life. So there's a real sense of experimentation and innovation going on in Chelsea at this time. So we're on Glebe Place now, and that's an important road for us in this tour because it was where many in the Chelsea Little Theatre community lived. So we're at number one Glebe Place, which was Margaret Morris's home from around 1917 up until 1930. And um, from around 1918, it began to house her expanding dance school and we're just around the corner from the Margaret Morris Theatre, so this would have been a really lively place with dancers coming and going, toing and froing from the theatre to the dance school. The artist Maxwell Armfield and his wife Constance Smedley rented this studio from early 1915 when they first moved to London. And they used the studio to stage performances for their little theatre, newly founded, called the Greenleaf Players. And the Greenleaf Players was inspired by the medieval troubadours, but it also had a lot in common with Margaret Morris's theatre and an interest in rhythmic drama. So in the summer of 1915, Armfield staged his play, The Minstrel, here in the studio. And it tells a tale of a wandering musician who manages to restore a devastated country to peace and plenty through his music. And it was, of course, a kind of veiled um, reflection on Armfield's own role as a pacifist and theatre maker uh, in times of war and coming under increasing pressure to enlist in the First World War. And on that note, Vernon Lee, the writer and Chelsea neighbour of the Armfields, gave her first recital of her pacifist satire, The Ballet of the Nations, which imagines war as a diabolical dance here in the studio in 1915. And it was published uh, with Armfields' pictorial commentary. 
And we shouldn't forget that reminders of, of war would have been everywhere around um, at that time with the Chelsea barracks nearby. And the artist uh, and suffragette Dora Meason Coates uh, remembered it in these words. She also lived on Glee Place. Suddenly Chelsea seemed to become an armed camp. Soldiers were bivouacked in Ranley Gardens and in the Royal Hospital grounds. Army motor lorries were rattling noisily along the usually quiet embankment. And those hot nights, we lay awake listening to the heavy, ominous rumble of laden troop trains all night long, slowly steaming out of Victoria Station. So here we are at number 43A, Hand Studio, as it was known, on Glebe Place. The Scottish architect, Charles Rennie Mackintosh, and his wife, the designer, Margaret MacDonald, moved here from Glasgow in 1915 and used two interconnected studios here on Glebe Place, and they lived nearby on Oakley Street. Charles Rennie Mackintosh and the German photographer, Emile Hoppe, who was also a Chelsea resident, in, uh, set up the Plough Club in 1917 for the purpose, as they described it, of simulating interest in good art of an unconventional kind. They were inspired by ideas of aesthetic synthesis and the dissident politics that characterise many in the Chelsea Little Theatre Network. So we're now on Cheney Walk, which for a long time through the 19th and into the 20th century was a place where many artists gathered and lived and many also had studios here. The arts and crafts architect C.R. Ashby designed several studios and houses uh, along this road. But it also became uh, the gathering place for many in the little theatre network. At number, at number 35, you could find the Blue Cockatoo, which was a cafe and restaurant where Margaret Morris, J.D. Ferguson, Augustus John and the Macintoshes would gather uh, to eat and discuss ideas. So we're now in front of Crosby Hall uh, and this medieval building was brought all the way from Bishopsgate, piece by piece, to Chelsea in 1910. Margaret Morris performed an afternoon of Grecian dances here in 1912 and this was characteristic of the Margaret Morris movement. Morris's dancers would often perform barefoot and in Grecian style costume. Performances continued at Crosby Hall through the First World War, but it also came to house Belgian refugees during the war. And the celebrated writer Henry James, who was also a Chelsea resident here, wrote an article in 1916 about the refugees in Chelsea, in which he celebrates this building. And he writes of it as one of the noblest relics of the past that London could show, describing the building as the headquarters of the Chelsea Circle of Hospitality to the Exiled. So we're around the corner from Royal Hospital Road, and at num number 71 was established the Corrick School, which was formerly known as the Clarissa Club. And it was founded by, just before the war, uh, by the poets and dancers John Rodker, Hester Sainsbury and Kathleen Dillon. So these were vibrant, experimental performances of dance poetry, an innovative form of performance at the time. And we get a sense of what those performances would have been like in the general atmosphere from one of the Society Weekly papers of the period, The Sketch. Where, where the, the soirees are described as a great antidote to war weariness. You could dance the foxtrot and look up at the futurist ceiling. And it was there, as the, as the sketch describes, that one could meet all the young artists who keep London humming like the big black beehive that it is. Mm -hmm. 